welcome everyone to our episode today. We're extremely fortunate to have uh, musicians uh, Sri T M Krishna with us today and disciple uh, Sri Ritri Karaja as well. Um, namaste and uh, welcome to both of you. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Um, so to, to kick things off, we wanted to explore a little bit about the art and the skills involved in, in teaching uh, music. So if you, you know, this question I'll pose at you, TM, sir. So um, you have, uh, you know, at some point a musician decides that they're going to start teaching or they would like to start teaching a student. Um, and presumably the only skills that you have uh, with you at that point when your experience level is zero is from what you've accumulated from your gurus and your own learning experiences. So from your own personal <laughs> How did you go about developing your skill set to teach? Okay, I started laughing because you pick up all kinds of things from your guru, right? Yeah. Uh, you pick up the beautiful and the ugly. And all gurus hand over both to their students. Yeah. Um, so I, I, know, I don't want to, I'm not going to romanticize this whole Guru Shishya thing and make this, this beautiful thing that we say, because that's a whole load of bunkum, okay? It's a complicated relationship. It'll remain complicated. It's um, deeply emotional. I mean, though we may not have a traditional Guru Sishya framework today in the sense of the Sishya students staying in the house, um, I think Ritwik will, will vouch for it and I say, I mean, they grew up at, at our home, right? So in a way, it is pretty similar, okay? Which, uh, which makes it very complicated. I mean, it's not simple at all. Um, and so when you, as, as a, I mean, when I started teaching, you can, you can prospectively ask yourself the question, were you ready to teach? Uh, the answer probably would be no. If you ask me the question today, I would say I wasn't. But then you start doing it and um, um, unfortunately your initial students really get the brunt of it. So Ritrik uh, pretty much stands out in that, that portion of my life. So poor guy, okay? So, uh, no, but you, you, I mean, you're carrying baggage, right? You're carrying all what you've seen as the ways of teaching. Your, uh, I mean, the way it's transmitted to you. So there's some incredible techniques that you pick up. You also pick up the you know, the complicated, the not so very pleasant things about this relationship. Uh, it's a power structure. Let's be very clear here. It's a power structure of the guru being extremely powerful. Okay. And you generally have a student who looks up to this person as this idol. So is there abuse of power? Yes, of course there is abuse of power. Uh, do all teachers to a large extent use it, manipulate it? Yes, we do. Now, I just want to put it out there straight. I don't want to play hide and seek on this one, okay? Because especially in the world of Carnatic music and Hindustani music, we make this Guru Shishya to be some flowery thing and students say flowery things, teachers say flowery things. Because it's, come on, yeah, let's be very clear. It's like a father and son or a father and daughter. I mean, you know how messy it is. But the messiness is, the recognizing the messiness is important. Okay. So and I think I that, that's one of the wonderful things about this is that, you know, we get to deconstruct this notion from a more sort of uh, distant perspective without the romanticization. I think it's, of... it's important that uh, I say this in the context of Guru Shishya, that we don't forget that this is also the relationship that is abusive and that has brought out all the Me Too cases that came out. Mm. I think it's important that I state it that uh, we cannot forget that this is also the relationship out of which we got so many complaints that of sexual harassment. And therefore, let's, be, let's, let's not brush that under the carpet. Uh, let's not think we've forgotten about it. We cannot forget, forget about any of those uh, cases. We can't forget about any of the statements that, statements that came out. And therefore, let's keep this in mind when we yeah. romanticize that relationship. Let's not ever forget that. I want very, to say that very on pertinent, record. Uh, absolutely very important. important. Yeah. The one thing that I think I picked up from my larger learning, which is my home and my schooling, is um, the, that questioning is the core to learning. This mm. I did not pick up from my music teachers. Let me be very clear, okay? Because the music environment, you can ask certain questions, you cannot ask certain questions. These are, my gurus are wonderful people. I mean, I just want to say because people immediately construe this to be some kind of, you know, uh, saying wrong things. No, they were old timers. My guru, Bhagavatul Sita Ravi Sharma, from whom I learned from age of five. He, I mean, I was like a son to him. I mean, I was his son, pretty much, okay? And um, I learned everything for 18 years from him. 
everything, everything. And then I learned from Shambhuri Mama towards the end of his life. And uh, that was a, a very different kind of relationship uh, with Shambhuri Mama. But nevertheless, I mean, you within the world of, you know, what we call Carnatic music or whatever, there are these limitations that are automatically there. We know what kind of questions we can ask. We know what kind of questions we should not ask. We know we can't challenge certain things. We know we can challenge certain things. And I think as students also, we play the game. You know, because you also want to feel liberal. Let's be very clear. So when you want to feel liberal, you ask the not so confrontational question and feel good about yourself. <laughs> and the teacher also feels that they're liberal because they answered that question. So, you know, this is much like larger society in our friendships and what we do in a, at a party, what we do when we meet somebody with certain powers. So you want to, you want to present yourself with that person with some forcefulness, but you know how much to push. But I grew up in a house, which was very different. I studied in a school, which was very different. I think that helped me a lot to allow the classroom, the music classroom, to be a debating square. Yeah. Interesting. You know, uh, that's all. I think Ritwik then can say what all I've lied and what all are the truth. <laughs> no, I think for me, um, where I'd like to take off is when he says there are certain kind of questions that you can ask a teacher and some that you can't. I don't think that restrictions ever been placed on me um, with respect to my relationship with him. Because right from something that's deeply personal to something that's deeply technical, no topics have ever been out of bounds and Never have I at least gotten a feeling that he's unhappy that I asked a certain question. But at times, if he maybe writes an article about something or maybe if um, there's an interview that I've seen and probably haven't come and maybe spoken to him about it or asked a few questions, the next time we meet is, didn't you have any questions after seeing that? So the kind of person that he is also reflects in the way he treats um, me as a student and also expects the same from me. Um, so he believes that there are no stupid questions, basically, um, in class um, or in life. So he, so his questioning is constant, and I think being so close to him, you kind of pick up on all of that, and you um, are obviously deeply influenced by it as well. You're a very lucky person to not have that restriction. No questions off bounds, and and and, and it, it related related to no, that. But so. then, the, but then the only flip side to that is then there are no questions. Um, no boundaries on the questions that he can ask me either that often puts me on the spot. As <laughs> it well. has so, its, right. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I think on, on, on this same theme, um, you know, if you, you know, because LCF, we are an equal opportunities questioner. This is equally to the guru and the shishya in this case. When you met your first guru or, you know, choose whichever one that you've learned from, what's the biggest change in your perception of them from the first time you saw them to, you know, many decades later after having learned with them for some time? What's the biggest change? And this is a question equally to both of you. Ritwik, you go first so I can think. Sure. Um, for me, my first teacher was my mother. So um, the relationship obviously was extremely informal and uh, um, yeah. I can't really differentiate um, the relationship between a mother and the son to that of a teacher because all the liberties that you take with your mother fills over. Um, mm. But with my second teacher, uh, Right from the time I was born, I used to go to her house with my mother for classes and I've seen her since then. So there was always this um, formality which was associated with that relationship. But um, mm. for me, meeting Krishnana for the first time was a, was a shock actually because even until then, um, as I was learning from my second teacher, she sent me out to listen to a lot of concerts and I chanced upon his concert in 2000 for the first time, mistaking it for T and Krishnan's concert. That was actually the first year I think I actually went out and started. I, I, actually, I actually don't know this story. This is the first time listening to this one. Yeah, aren't you glad you came on this interview? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so after one of the afternoon concerts, I was kind of um, hanging around the music academy lobby when I heard three, four people talking to each other that they're all going to be at T and Krishnan's concert at Astika Samajam that evening. So I decided to go as well. And I'm somebody who loves to sit near the stage and listen to concerts. And um, Astika Samajam is a very informal open setting. So I was sitting down on the floor and I obviously was expecting T.M. Krishnan to walk in and, and in 2000, he was about 24 years old. So there's a 24 year old guy who walks up on stage with two very senior artists. I think it was Bellur um, Rambadran uh, sir on the Mridangam, I remember very clearly. And uh, I was first very shocked and I wasn't sure at which concert, maybe I came to the wrong venue. But then he started by singing Seshachal and Ayakam and I remember being completely floored. So 
from there for the next two or three years, I followed him around to every single concert because that was, <clears throat> that was my first experience of um, witnessing somebody whom I could relate to in terms of how they were, in terms of how they presented themselves, in terms of how um, natural they were being on stage, as opposed to this imagery of Carnatic music being old and being a certain way that is, um, that was even more so prevalent way back in 2000. And from there, I remember till about 2003, I bought every single cassette that he put out um, at uh, this little music store on Eldams Road. And I had many people later at that point recommend my name to him. And when he started taking students, he said, okay, so many of you are bothering me about this boy. What is this about? Let me have <laughs> listen. And he finally um, mentioned to a family friend to ask me to come home and sing to him. And I remember when I um, went at around 3.30 in the afternoon, the house was, all the lights were off and he was asleep. And then he barely just woke up when I rang the bell. And I was extremely nervous that first class. But right from the word go, it was extremely comfortable in terms of, I felt a sense of security and comfort. And I had prepared just one Varnam and one song. And he said, sing something. And I said, okay, can I sing this Varnam? He said, no, sing the Kalyani Aditala Varnam. So then I remember mentioning to him saying, it's been years since I sang it. I don't remember it at all. At which point he said, it's okay if you make mistakes. I'm just, I just, I just want to listen to you sing. And I sang and then he made some corrections and then I sang back. And he didn't say much. My grandmother and my mother were sitting in the hall. Um, he just came back out and basically told my mother, look, saying uh, he's able to kind of understand when I sing to him and he's able to sing the corrections back to me. So we'll see how this works. We'll give this a six month uh, shot because um, I'm obviously extremely busy in my musical career and he's at a stage where he requires a lot of money. So if I feel that I'm not able to give him the attention that he um, needs at this point, then after maybe six months, I will be happy to maybe suggest somebody else who can uh, be a better teacher to him. And after that, I think after that, when I started going to classes till today, he hasn't I don't think he even remembers that or the fact that he said that. So after six months, I remember being very nervous to see if he was going to say something, but <laughs> by then he had probably forgotten all about it. So, so would yeah. you say this was the biggest change in your perception from that first time you sang in front of him is that you thought you weren't going to be with him for such a long time and you ended up being his long-term student? Stuck, or... stuck, stuck. No, but, no, but <laughs> surprisingly what that did was made me work extra hard for those six months to make sure that I was doing the best that I could. So, yeah, I mean, so that was probably a blessing in disguise, I would say. Over to you. So, um, my, see, my first Guru Bhagavatala Sitaram Sharma, sir, uh, knew me from when I was what, three years old. Um, he, my mother, my mother learned to sing. She was a graduate in music, uh, not a professional singer, and learned from uh, actually Shamudi Mama's student, originally. And then... Um, she, after I was born, uh, she wanted to revive her music and that's when she got acquainted with my guru. And he used to come home to sing and apparently I showed some talent when I was what, four or five or th I don't know, something like that. Anyway, so I started learning when I was about six. So, you know, that's a very different relationship, right? He's almost like a father. I mean, uh, mm. uh, you, you know, literally, I mean, you know, and he was an old timer. He'd come from the village Kuchipudi, from a traditional artist family. Uh, he had joined, he was in Kalakshatra, he was a teacher there and a composer. In fact, many ballets, music was done by Sharma sir. And so my relationship with him was very different. Um, it was very close, but it was also very, uh, there was that uh, generational gap, no doubt. And I was also growing up, right? I mean, I was growing up, young guy uh, in, the, in the 80s. So there was a generation gap, yet it was very close. So it was, that's why I said father son is probably a right uh, analogy for that relationship. Um, and um, he was very strict, very strict. Um, and you know, if I didn't practice, I, I was done for. I would rather be. I would. I would prefer playing cricket on the street than come for music class. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I used to run back for class in time. He used to come in his Lambretta uh, uh, scooter to teach uh, music. And he was also a family friend. So after class, he'll hang out with my dad. He used to have a drink with my dad and then take a Lambretta and go back home. This was almost a routine. So, so he was very close to our family, but he was also a very old thinking person from a different, from a different mindset. So there was this closeness. There was also, I think, certain things where, you know, 
we were just very different. We just had very different uh, views. So, but it was a very close relationship till the very end. Uh, and uh, so I can't really say perceptions change because I grew up with him. So you don't really, you can't spot it. You know what I mean? When you grow yeah. up with somebody from five or six, like your parents, can you say your perception of your parents change? You really don't know, right? Right. right. Uh, it's so interlayered. So with him, but with Shamuri Mama, I will tell you, yes. So when I first, um, I learned from, I, my, my, me learning from Mama was an accident. He came for a concert of mine, actually not too far from where I live now. Um, and after the concert, looked at my father and said, send him to me. Um, mm. It was just completely by accident. And I went on Vijay Dasmi Day. I was terrified to, this is the man that I have, you know, you, I mean, he's like a, he's like one of the greatest musicians this country has seen. And, you know, you have this image of this person and, you know, you really, I mean, this, he, I mean, he's part of folklore. Okay. He's just living, but he's folklore. Right. And I was petrified to meet him. But then he was so much fun. You know, <laughs> if an, you know, I really, I mean, an artist should, I mean, he's one of those people who live, who is alive. Uh, who is alive, who's, who he was. Uh, you know, he was a uh, great sense of humor never missed his, his, he watched everything. He knew everything in the news. He knew all the music politics. He knew what was happening in the music session. If there was a raga being discussed, he'll ask me, you know, so he was clued in, he was alive. He was, he was really an artist. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the sense he was, he was what he got. I mean, what you saw was what you got. Okay. And so we had actually, I mean, I joined him much later in his life. He's supposed to be a much more difficult person in his younger days. So I didn't, I didn't see that side of Shamburi Mama as a teacher. I saw a person who was much, who was jolly, uh, who had a lot of sarcasm, a lot of, you know, uh, you know, a lot of chat about everything. I used to spend a lot of time singing and discussing old musicians. So there, there was a perception shift that, you know, he was almost like a friend in many ways. It was very, very unusual for me to say that and use that word because he was what, 80 plus 90, clocking 90 almost. I was what, in my 20s. You know, it was unusual. But it was a very, uh, it was a wonderful friendship. And uh, it was, he, was, he, was a, he was a great guy. I mean, he was really a great guy. I mean, absolutely. Fascinating. Wonderful insight. I mean, it's wonderful to hear these stories from both of you of, like you said, this, this personal complex relationship, um, you know, distilled, in, you know, into some of these fascinating anecdotes. So, uh, yeah, thank you both. Adesh, did you want to continue? Yeah. Uh, one word that Ritvik was using quite a lot was the word comfortable. And, you know, um, Krishnani was saying you make it an environment which is, you uh, like give a space for your students to ask whatever questions they want, and you have a, that very impersonal relationship, a very personal relationship with them, rather. So presumably, students who have had experiences with other teachers come to you with a certain perception of what their teacher will be like, or that teacher-student relationship should be like. Do you uh, almost respect that boundary and that idea of what they have with their teacher, or do you encourage all of your students to have that break down those same boundaries in the, in the way that you had with Ritvik? What do you think? Look at my face. Uh -huh. <laughs> The shortest answer ever for an yeah, LCF question. I mean, no way. I mean, uh, see, I very strongly believe that there can't be any walls. Okay? Yeah. Not that I've perfected that. Let me very, be very clear. Not that I'm some saint who is just, uh, you know, egoless guy who accepts between hugs and kisses. Nonsense. Yeah. As much as I say that, I'm also complicated. Uh -huh. There are times when my ego is, is, is pricked by my students and I do react and they know it. But that's, that's, that's part and parcel of it. That doesn't mean tomorrow I stop something. So I'm also learning. See, one thing I have realized is that I'm also learning. Uh, what I am today is not what I was 15 years ago. So I'm also learning, right? And I think that's a lifelong happening. But to be constantly aware that this is how it is, is itself a, a, a possibility. Now, if you don't think, if you're not aware of it, then what happens, it just shuts it down then you go back to your own crusty self or you force upon a crustiness on somebody else. Now, as my students who come from very different teachers, okay, I mean, after think you had, I've not taken so many students because I really have not had the time and I really believe in having uh, a personal co connection with the student and spending time. Uh, but all of them had very different kind of teachers. And one, I never asked them, any of them, I've never asked any one of them about their relationship with their previous group. Never. They may share it with me at some point of time, it is shared. 
If it is not shared, it is not shared. If there's anything that I don't question, that's the only thing I don't question. Okay. <laughs> because I think that's, that's a space I can, I'll ask them about their girlfriends, of course, or boyfriends, but I mean, I will not ask this question. Hmm. Okay. But everything <laughs> else, everything else is, I, it's important to break it down for me, you know, because I think art really, you know, art is pleasurable. Art can be satisfied. Art can be reiterating. Art can be enjoyable. But if art has to really push, and I mean first push yourself, forget about everybody else, there cannot be any limitation put on it. And which means the individual must be able to like burst open. I know I can't, there's, there's no proper expression for this. There has to be that, that boom, okay? So, so for me, for that, there can't be barriers, okay? Yeah. There can't be any barriers in you, right? And so you need, and for me, that's why the conversation cannot be just about Todi, Kamboji, Kalyani. It has to be everything. Because Todi is not an entity by itself that in isolation. Todi mm -hmm. is an entity that is part of your physical construction, your mental construction, your political construction, your social, your historical, everything. That abstract idea, I mean, that's the whole beauty of art. And we, I don't know why we don't see it that way. That this abstract idea is so full of life. Mm. It's so full of life beyond what re, what ga, what ma, what the, how many kirtanams, tyagaraja, dikshtar, beyond everything, it is full of life. And every one of those things have participated in that. You know? And so as an individual, as you expand, and to expand, you have to be questioning. Have I struggled with some students to make them question? Of course, <laughs> that, that I have, because I think sometimes it's difficult for certain people. And that's the time I lose my shirt and that's my great weakness. Uh, and I, you know, I, I have, I kind of pushed people beyond where I should have pushed at times, I think. And I, I think that's, that's my uh, inability mm -hmm. to see that certain people need to be handled different ways. And now I'm, I've learned it now. I mean, at some point in time I didn't, uh, but I do believe in pushing that that pedal mm -hmm. as much as possible when something happens. And what is that something? I don't know. You know, it's that something. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, this, um, you talked about, you know, a lot, lot of things there to, to delve into, you know, for example, the, the, uh, you know, you talked about, for example, authority isn't just the, the construction of it. It's all the things that happen around you and also the history of the Raga itself and the history of the people that, you know, what are the story, the human stories that led to these, this art being created as well. But you know, you also talked about um, pushing students further than they were maybe comfortable for. Uh, and again, this is a question for both of you. Um, you know, you both have students, you also have students. How do you find your teaching style of adjusting to the, to the student has changed with time? You know, how, are there these, what are, the, what are the kind of salient learnings that you, know, you would say you've done from having taught for so many years or uh, X number of people? <laughs> Anna, you should probably take this one first. Okay. I, like I said, um, there are a lot of learnings. I think uh, one of the important learnings, is, like, which I stated already, is about understanding uh, different people are different, students are different. I think one of the things that teachers rarely do, the best of teachers rarely do, is um, respect their student enough to change mm. what they are doing. Right. I see. And, and, and that rarely happens and rarely happens because of ego and because of the power structure. Uh, I'm not saying that I, I had really done it, but I think that I'm slightly better than before. Uh, that I, I now know, know far more that there are things that I need to do because you kind of, I think our point, you know, even with all this liberalism and this questioning, you also become very, you know, you have certain things that get stuck in you. I mean, it happens to every one of us. And I think yep. that that's why it requires a constant uh, self self awareness and questioning of yourself. Who were you are? I mean, I don't care who the hell you are. Um, uh, and then I think you start learning that you need different methods for different people, and you also need to recognize people. Even the student sees music maybe differently from you. That's a tough one, by the way. You know, or sees society differently from me. For me, that's a much harder one, because <laughs> I, I I believe in a very open, very free a completely non-discriminative kind of discourse. Not that not, I mean, society becoming like that is utopian, but at least the discourse becoming like that. Not all my students see it that way. 
Is it difficult for me? Of course it's difficult for me. But I think I've learned to, to, to understand it you mm. know, um, much more than um, some years ago. I've learned to understand yeah. it. And I, I mean, of course, I'll still find ways of putting that line through and saying, you know, what do you think of this? You know, because I'm hoping, because I am hoping that somewhere, some window will open for that student and say, you know what, maybe there's a point here. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you're right, don't say I'm right. You know, that's very rarely going to come out of anybody's mouth, by the way. But even if, you know, you see actions that say, okay, I can see some, some movement there. It's fine, but I think these are all things that you constantly learn, you know? Um, and I'm, 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 I'm still learning. I'm still learning um, because um, I'm very invested in certain things, in certain, certain ideas of, of, of music, ideas of what we are. I'm very invested, but I don't expect, for example, my students to do exactly what I'm doing. That's one thing I'm very clear about. You can ask, I mean, Ritwik will respond after that. I have never told them to either do or sing or speak the way I do. Never. Uh, we've argued everything that I write about or everything I sing or my changes in every classroom. Ad nauseum we've argued. Okay? But I've never said you should sing this or you should, you should, you should make, you ask the questions. Because I think that it's my journey has come, taken me here. Each one needs to figure their journey. My job is only one thing is to make sure the mind is open to receive and to make sure that they are being self-critical in questioning. If I can make sure that that's there, the rest is for them to figure out. So, so in your opinion, do you think there's an overemphasis on this idea of Padantaram or Bani or sticking to the same style as your teacher? Is that something that you obviously said from your perspective is your, you encourage your students to, to be open to exploring the music in the way they, they see fit? under your well, guidance. I mean, look, let me put it this way. So there is a certain period of time when you need to stick to a certain form. Okay. Um, that's part of the learning process. It's, I mean, it's, it's like you learn anything you need to first, you know, shall we say, have complete access of the form, right? To get complete access to the form, it's convenient to take one path. That's all. It's convenient. That's the word. It's easier and simpler and convenient to say, I'll take this path so I have access. But I mean, when I grew up, what did I do? You know, my guru was Sitaram Sharma. He was very clear about teaching this way, but he never stopped me from going for concerts. He never stopped me from being influenced. I was a TV Shankaran, uh, sir's, you know, crazy fan. Mm -hmm. My music initially sounded like his. My guru never came and told me, why are you, why are you singing? Never. So I must say that's also an important point. So when I look at what I did, I described, if somebody had cut off this conversation, my previous description of my guru, which, which I just finished, you would have thought of this guy, this man of not allowing me to do things, which is not true. Right? So there is also that, right? That you can't really, in a way, maybe bottle anybody in any kind of a yeah. jacket, right? So he never opposed me being influenced by 100 people. But maybe that's also because he was not a performer. Maybe if my guru was a famous performer, I would have had a different kind of a, a yeah. road to deal with, right? So, no, but that apart to your question. Um, so I think there is a period of time where you need certain structures learning but i think you and your teacher both know when things can then that's over that stage is kind of shall we say over then i do not believe in this notion of one body okay i do believe that also there there is and especially in the world that we live in uh when a lot of cross pollination is part of the world that we live in i think it's important even within a genre of music that cross-pollination happens. Now, there is this misnomer here that this will lead to, uh, this means that there is no identity markers, right? Mm -hmm. That is utter nonsense. That's just rubbish. Because I can today tell you Barney markers from artists who have been cross-pollinated, right? So this idea that if you, if you get, you know, if you pick up from the rear, then there's no a notion of uh, Barney's, the idea of Barney's will die. I mean, all this is just nostalgic mumbo jumbo that people yeah. like parrot, okay? Very bluntly put. When, we, when I become 75 and somebody else is 80 or somebody 60, the next generation is going to talk about other bodies. I mean, this is yeah. just time. Ultimately, it's time and generation, right? So I think it's important after a point of time mm -hmm. to listen freely. And I want to say one thing. It is not just listening to Carnatic music. 
it is also listening and receiving from every other form of art which is also mm. something carnatic musicians are abysmal at doing <laughs> okay which can actually may, be tremendously liberating if you yes. allow yourself to do it yeah so they will casually listen to other things and seriously listen to one thing i am talking about seriously listening to everything yeah sure okay so for me um i'm still a very young teacher um i've been teaching for probably the last 2 or 3 years and my students are much younger so the kind mm. of conversations that i have with him today um is probably not the same kind of conversations that i would have with my students who are maybe 13 or 15 in fact in fact right. when i joined him i think i was about 13 and the conversations were more about how was school today um how much how much did you score in your match last sunday or something like that so yeah. um so the conversations are probably like that but then i think also the important thing to understand here is i have gained the freedom and the trust of having such conversations with my teacher not not purely because i joined him but because there's been a continuous building of the relationship over a few years after which there is a certain mm-hmm. blossoming in the relationship that happens so freedom that you right so i mean so if i'm trying to recreate the same relationship that i share with my teacher with every single one of my students then i'm automatically um placing a bias in my mind as to what i expect that relationship to be which i mm. think is probably not the right way to go about it um the other thing also that i think i want to say here is in terms of having a relationship with my teacher and the kind of conversations that i have with krishnana for example it is not mutually exclusive in terms of the conversations that he has with me vis-a-vis the other students sangeeta ka and everybody else there because many of the times the conversations are spillovers between multiple people and you learn so much when you're in a conversation where many other people are contributing with their own thoughts as well so i mean mm. i mean so for me i don't think i was ever as vocal um with my thoughts until i actually um was in the environment of class and conversation around anna so i think that's been a great thing for me in terms of just learning to speak up a little bit more and maybe be a little bit more free about what i have to say which um which is liberating in many ways and that automatically of course reflects in music as well and like he said um music is of course a manifestation of all of your emotions when when you're trying to sing and when the music has to have life you emote as much as possible and your emotions are not separate you're singing as opposed to how you feel the same emotions when you're going through life so i learned that over a period of time from him where um it is impossible or even if you try to kind of separate and structure your musical emotion separate from all the other emotions you go through in life right now to me it feels extremely unnatural to even think of it that way because you've seen where the spillovers are and you kind of begun to maybe understand how one influences the other so i think that has really opened up many more avenues for me learning from him as opposed to of course learning the usual compositions and the varnams and all of that which was of course a major part of my learning when i joined him in 2003 for the next 7 or 8 years but after that it's been more about um kind of unraveling all of these things and maybe understanding life better as opposed to me learning the same number of compositions now as i did say 15 years ago hmm fascinating insight yeah and uh, you talk about the emotional investment and that's something that we'll come to later on as well about you know that the the um one thing that's very clear from uh, krishnanna's uh, music is just the sheer intensity of emotional um investment in music and uh you know i think that's clear from you know all of his students as well but just um how how you know uh, is it a thing that maybe we haven't necessarily Now, as you say do we compartmentalize the way that we link emotion and music in the carnatic world more than we should and how do we kind of break that straight jacket you know is an interesting uh thing to explore sure um i absolutely think that we do because unless let's say that i was with a different uh, teacher who probably did not have as many conversations with me who probably did not um maybe show me the possibilities um through conversation or maybe just through music or through action then all of this would have taken probably a lot longer for me to figure out if i was on this path if suppose i was on a completely different journey then i may then i may probably not even explore this side of my music or this side of my life for 
many many years so i think that's definitely a possibility mm -hmm. and um, sorry i missed the first part of your question no, it, it was just uh, about this uh, basically learning how to actually connect emotions with music in a way that perhaps we haven't done uh, you know right. is that can that be a taught skill in a way you know is there is there a way that you get you know, you were saying that the way you have your conversations with your guru, it, has it helped you open up the linking between emotion and music? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, the conversations have definitely helped. And I think the more important thing to realize here is when you mention um, just visually seeing Anna so emotionally invested and intense whenever mm. he's performing. We've spoken to him for the last 45 minutes and you know that that's the kind of person that he is. He's extremely emotional. Yeah. He's intense he's a serious person he likes good serious conversation and he's somebody who's lucky as a musician sorry i'm interrupting he basically said i'm a boring guy just to make it easy. <laughs> that's, that's actually not what i said i mean i mean but what i'm trying to say is that he's probably one of the few musicians who's managed to find a window between this and that and link the both effortlessly together which i think a lot of musicians are either struggling to do or don't think is important to do as well. But only for somebody who's maybe felt that experience as part of their musical journey, see the importance in um, both the worlds spilling over to each other and investing completely every single mm. part of your being. So, so both of you, both of you have touched on this, the wider environment that you're in when you're, when you're learning from a teacher. So the conversations that are happening outside of the class, the discussions that you're, you know, that you hear and that you're part of as well, even if it's passive. So clearly there's like a, it's not just the class when you sit and learn your Kriti or your Varnam or whatever Manodharmam you, you spend in that class. So with that in light, um, with that in mind rather, can the same relationship be had over a Skype class or a FaceTime class when you just have that half an hour, 45 minutes a week is, you know, how much of a difference uh, for to you, Ritvik, did it make having that face-to-face -face classes and that general uh, engagement outside of this? And Krishna, sir, as well, do you think this relationship can be developed and built over uh, virtual or, uh, you know, other, meet, other forms? Especially with the lockdown. Yeah, Ritvik, you're better, you're better equipped than me to answer this question. I mean, I joined them in 2003, so it's been 17 years. And until the lockdown now, I've never had one single virtual Skype or FaceTime or Zoom class from him. Yeah. But I mean, I was lucky because the distance between my home and my college and his house was all within literally one kilometer. So, okay. um, I mean, so I would just jump between these three locations. But what is important, I guess, is apart from the relationship being just within the classroom, I remember in 2006 when I finished school, I joined Vivekananda College because the college was um, lenient towards kids who pursued the classical arts. So which means that then I got more time and space to um, go to class and to do whatever else. Sorry, I, I just love the way you put it, but go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I mean, so I remember right from 2006 um, for one of his concerts in Kerala. I asked him if I could come along and he said, yeah, sure. And from then onwards, I think till about 2011, um, I think the year or a couple of years after I finished college, whenever he had an outstation concert, there were so many times where he would book a ticket for me while he was doing his tickets without even asking me because, because it was understood that my life revolved around everything music. And I was extremely happy to be part of a journey like that because the learning did not just stop in class. And when I talk about class, um, it's not go to class at 5 o'clock, get done by 6, 6.30, go back home. I remember um, a couple of other students used to come before me, start class at 5. I still used to be there at 5 o'clock to listen in on their classes. My class would begin sometime by around 7, 7.30 and I've had classes that have gone on till 1.32 in the night. And I would go to class with a 90 minute cassette back then. and beyond 90 minutes, the class would still keep going on and I wouldn't have a recording of it. And um, so many of those classes, I remember um, his children, Arya and Anita, were much younger. They would go to sleep, but Sangeetaka would probably order in from Copper Chimney or would have um, cooked dinner and she wouldn't have had dinner yet. And many of those classes post 12, 12.30, 1 in the night, I would stay back, have dinner with them. And of course, it would lead to a lot of conversation and go back home by 2.33. There have been a few nights where it's become so late that I've just crashed on their couch and went straight to college from there. So that's the kind of relationship and that's 
And yeah. we, when I think of learning, it's extremely difficult for me to imagine everything else because this is the experience that I went through. And going mm. on journeys um, with him for concerts and being just being a silent spectator mm. to conversations that he has with, uh, say, three other artists when everybody's traveling together um, yeah. in a different city. These are experiences that I think are extremely unique that you learn so much from and becomes a part of you. There are so many conversations that you might not understand as a 15 year old, but certain portions of it stick with you that many years later begin to make sense. So for me, learning, mm. when people talk about holistic learning, I think this is what it should be like. Um, and I'm sure there are multiple different ways by which this nature of holistic-ness uh, can be achieved. But yeah. I'm glad that this is um, what my training was. The in-person yeah. version. Yeah, Fascinating. the in-person version. So, really uh, so, I mean, so which yeah. is why when you ask me if it's possible for um, such a relationship to exist over a 45 minute Zoom call or a one hour Skype class, it is something that I don't think I can imagine. Before you start and finish, I think there's so much music that goes on in that one hour that there's barely any space for anything else. Uh, but just uh, uh, maybe you're going to say the same thing, Adesh. Uh, it'd be very interesting to hear uh, Krishna's answer to that. But it, you know, what, one thing I just like a thought I'd like to place to see the answer is we're obviously all concerned about equality of access and opportunity. At the moment, the current situation makes that difficult in many ways, and even many people who may want to access Carnatic music may not live, you know, in Chennai or in, close to a guru or whatever in that same sense. So, of course recognizing the innate value in all that you just said to think about the the in-person experience you know what what can be done in terms of that access aspect you know but, but yeah please sure uh, uh, continue. i think i think one thing i need to acknowledge is i was extremely lucky to have joined him at that particular time in his life when he probably mm -hmm. had more space and more time because i know students who've joined the last five six years who probably don't get the same amount of time from him because um, because of so many other things. There are more students now. He's um, his time is more limited. So that was just pure luck on my part. So uh, apart from that, with respect to what you're saying, I do understand the situation in terms of having access to a certain kind of music or a certain um, style of music that you really enjoy and want to learn. But that's where I think um, what my teacher, of course, Krishna Arna did was, um, I, I probably did not understand it then, but I see sense in it now where even when he took students who lived in the US per se, he would never um, say yes to somebody unless they were willing to spend their entire summer of two and a half months in Chennai, where they got access yeah. to him every single day. Mm, where he believed mm. that just learning online would not be sufficient. So if they did want to learn from him, that meant that they had to make a commitment um, to be in India for three months in a year so that everything that he teaches them will kind of maybe mold or give them enough tools to work with for the remaining nine months, which I think is a fabulous way to approach online teaching as well, where um, you create and probably give the students certain tools in person that they can then polish on their own mm -hmm. time that is probably a little more easier to explain through the online mm -hmm. medium as opposed to the relationship being only through the online media. You know, it's funny to say, you know, I, I come from a different generation, you know, to a large extent, right? So uh, I've never been comfortable with uh, teaching online. That's the truth. Um, but I, I recognized quite early the necessity of it. I mean, you can't run away from the fact that if you have people living in different places who want to learn from you, I mean, you, you know, it's a tool that's needed. Um, at the same time, so therefore I had this, this via media solution and said, look, if one thing is, I have to be clear that I took students who were at a certain level, right? So at that level, I am also a person who believes that if you want to learn from me, you have to show commitment to the art. You're not casual learning. There are many people who casually learn. There's nothing wrong with that. We casually learn so many things, right? So for the serious learner, I can say this is a workable solution. Okay. Now for the serious learner, I felt that personal Time is important. Face-to-face -face time was important. Now, the question, your question becomes complicated with a casual learner. But then I can answer that by saying, but the casual learner may not be interested in the intense relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for a casual learner, just Skype is fine. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just doing one more thing that I need to do through the week. I go for swimming class. I also go for music class. If that's what it is, or, you know, then it's fine, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, you don't need the... Uh, 
you don't need to have that bond. You mean, I mean, you get what you want and uh, you go on. But if at some point it tips and say, hey, this is something serious, then the, the Skype system kind of, at least in today's mode, is incapable of providing. Now, can it change tomorrow? Can we have a kind of technology that makes it intimate? Possibly. Or will we change? That's another question that we cannot completely uh, mm. you know, dissociate from this. We are unable to change now, and therefore we are having this conversation, right? Uh, but we are all using sanitizers six days, six times a day today. I hated using sanitizers one and a half months ago. It's become a norm now. I don't even think it's a reflex, right? So maybe we will also change and we can, maybe we'll build, I, this is complete hypothesis. We'll build a different kind of intimacy through the medium that is presented to us. Maybe, maybe. It still will not be the same. I mean, whatever said and done a telephone conversation, is not the same as talking to someone. But today, nobody calls. Everybody messages. Your, your, your emoji has replaced you telling somebody, I love you. Now, isn't that a new way of emoting an intimacy in some fashion? It is intimacy. You're telling your lover you love her or love him. But you're not picking the phone and telling the person. You're sending an emoji. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, let's be, I think let me be a little careful. Um, underestimating uh, human behavior and underestimating technology. We may change the way we emote. We may change the notion of intimacy. Anything is possible. It's going to be fascinating to watch. But let me tell you, it's only for people who have access to this technology. What about the people, yeah. thousands and millions of people who have no access to this, who want to learn any art form? I am concerned mm -hmm. for them. That's, there's, that's, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a very tough time for that situation. So on that note of increasing accessibility and getting a wider audience engaged with music as a whole, not just Carnatic music, but all genres of music. So having, so having grown up here in London, so we had music was compulsory in schools up to 10th standard. So we had like two hours a week, I remember, and this was world music. So it wasn't just all your European musicians and stuff. So we did blues, we did jazz, everything. And you, we, you know, for a, a good term or half the term, we'd be invested in that genre. So we'd be advised to listen to that music, experiment with our music, you know, play on the keyboards at school and spend our lunch times doing that. <clears throat> so just uh, Ritvik, having grown up, you know, in India, what is it like? Is there music education in schools? Um, and then uh, Krishna said, do you think that there should be more music education in schools uh, to increase and widen participation? Because as you've said, if you don't have the technology to listen to concerts or get access to people remotely, uh, if you don't have a teacher in the vicinity or one who's willing to take you on, and if you don't have the family structure or set up or the background for it, then where are you going to get that inspiration or that, that spark of interest from? Mm. Ritwin, you go. Um, yes, I think music education is important, but I think given the time that we are in, we need to kind of reinvent how it's being done as opposed to maybe having one teacher who teaches a bunch of students uh, mm. a few songs or uh, something like that. Because because I remember we used to have a couple of teachers, one that taught uh, a few more Carnatic flavored songs and one that taught us a few Western songs and who played the piano. Both of them interestingly had uh, Carnatic music connections because uh, the piano teacher was Shemanguri Mama's daughter-in-law, uh, Meena Miss, and uh, the Carnatic teacher was uh, DK Jayaraman's daughter-in-law, Shamala Miss. And uh, so right from there, I think uh, um, all of us still maybe remember those small songs and jingles and bhajans that we all remember from school, but does that actually make a difference in the way a young student receives music or the kind of impact that the student um, feels towards the music. So I think in terms of what is available to us today, in terms of technology or just in terms of maybe coming up with a different curriculum that can be more comprehensive in terms of how the mm. students are exposed to different genres, like what you were talking about um, that you went through in school or maybe um, exposing them to different forms of art itself and not limiting it mm. just to music. I think that process can probably um, leave a much larger impact and probably expand the horizons of a young mind much more in today's generation where um, people seem to want more uh, exposure to different things as opposed to still sticking to the old module of maybe um, 
having two hour weekly music classes as part of mm. your curriculum and maybe kind of thinking about ways by which the idea can be reinvented and maybe turning the wheel around okay there's only one thing i'm very good at is to problematize something so i'll just do that okay so so let's think about what you said uh, you know this is something that many people have asked right do we do we create curriculum for for music but the big question is what music will be permitted what music will not be permitted so even in our, your examples in in london or anywhere in the world we know what are the kinds of forms of music that a class is acceptable in a school environment is considered good enough important enough complicated within courts enough um, to enrich the child's mind you know yeah. because there are hundreds of art forms across dotted across the world which will never find will never get entry within those gates mm -hmm. there's an implicit okay. judgment about, about what oh, oh, this is, this is this is part of race part of color part of caste part of gender all discriminations are in it so i'm a little wary about this that's all i'm saying i'm very wary about this so is you know if you say, any guarantee that the the guru will be any better at filtering that than say a school a, a nationwide sort of curriculum that's trying to no, be no this is a, no this is societal problem so yeah. that societies are structured this way every society is structured i mean i tell you i i quote this many times and there was this incredible musicologist by name harold powers um, i met him to his end of his life he was in princeton he became a very dear friend of mine and one day i asked him asked him a question very he asked with great naivety i said the harold what's the difference between classical music and folk and he said oh that's very simple whenever an art form goes up the social ladder it moves from folk to classical <laughs> and that's the answer to your question about curriculum in school that mm. ones that are closer to being up in society will be what schools permit mm. or schools considered important it's like maths yeah. is important so my question is yes but i think I, what rithvik said has resonance here in the sense can we if you because you know it's very odd right because we talk about democracy we talk about schools being an open environment we talk about being exposed to everything but even the liberal world knows that everything is not everything everything is curated by the liberal world within its own conditionality right so i'm just saying we have you know when i say that i want my child to be exposed uh, why will my child never hear pariyatam in a school or learn parai because parai is considered something that is lowly it is not it's played by a certain community that are that are not even discussed it's played by dalits or kut so i'm saying there have been efforts to change this no doubt and a lot of people doing great work and i'm i'm, I'm putting that on record but i'm saying when we say we want music in school my question is what music are you going to give i don't know how are you how are you going to judge and and your judgment is full of baggage hmm. i mean i when i when i i tell you i was as limited as anybody else when i started diving into other aesthetics and i mean diving in not standing and getting exposed they're very different things when you dive in you debaggage yourself at least temporarily mm. when you get exposed you're judging based on your baggage that's the difference so you know when i dive dive i found things that i thought were simple or things that i thought were unimportant were like magic you know and i i just didn't have the eyes to see the magic so mm. i think truly if we want to do something like this of bringing art to the classroom i think it has to be a a very complicated process where we actually yes, challenge these systems like we challenge these systems because the only way people can change is if they emotionally change and art allows us this opportunity to do that we don't do it we don't create those bridges those catalysts those those um, you know those little uh, conduits that can allow for this for this possibility so i would say yes art in school and like rithvik said yes multiple arts and i think it has to be done with a great sense of equality respect mm. and responsibility yeah fascinating um fascinating in certain are this you want to go into the uh, like go with the question on um uh, mm. the the bhakti question <laughs> <laughs> you like this one i can tell yeah. you like this one so um going back to what we were our experiences in school you know um a very pertinent points that you said uh about um what is deemed to be a, a, you know, um 
worthy of children's education and uh, you know what is uh, what makes the cut and what doesn't one interesting thing that Adesh and I will have uh, shared from our musical education is you know not only was there quite a wide uh, education in terms of genre but also in terms of things that had a religious kind of substrate or not you know and you know I grew up singing in the Christmas service uh, every yeah. you know uh, Adesh is nodding as well you know and, and never was there a sense of uh, at least on my part that I was being involved in something that was not mine you know there was no sense of uh, I'm stepping into someone else's territory and I know this is something that you very eloquently talked about um, in, a, in a variety of places but you know bringing this to some some direct discussion of your music if you look at the comments say on, on some of your um, concert videos uh, on you in, <laughs> invariably they will be they will be, this is drenched in bhakti, you know, they will, you know, I, I'm talking about the good ones, right? Uh, basically, there's, there's a concept of involvement and emotional intensity and, you know, secular uh, definition of the word devotion that is very evident in the art that you portray, you know. What, how can we transcend the, you know, the very, you know, perhaps we, we have been, we've been, we've imbibed a very traditionalist view of what this thing means and Carnatic music is the music of a particular type of religious expression, you know, but clearly, I mean, one, one thing that's often been said about, uh, you know, Pete, I think perhaps it's been misunderstood that you're talking against that, whereas actually there's a tremendous degree of, um, uh, you know, uh, involvement that transcends any kind of label, which I think um, we're trying to um, get people to appreciate. What's your understanding of this uh, concept of that, you know, what's called bhakti, you know, can that, you know, how, how what are your experiences of trying to share this and secularize or make this accessible in a broader sense? Uh, well, uh, firstly, I think that, you know, I mean, your examples of singing carols is so important because we did it. Uh, we did at school, we used to sing for Christmas uh, mm. and we didn't, we didn't think twice about it, you know, I mean, right. uh, I mean it, was, it, was, it was not something that you really like consciously thought that Christianity is not Indian. Christianity for me was as Indian as Islam was Indian or Hinduism was Indian. Uh, I never thought of these as being, you know, othering them or of them being coming from outside because, you know, this how is, exactly. I mean, I mean, we're going to political conversation of you know, how is the outsider defined and what this defines the nation building exercise? Because this is a political uh, debate on creating the nation. And that's where these conversations become important. Uh, but coming to your question of bhakti, see, I mean, what is it? Bhakti is a feeling. It's an emotion. I mean, it is, it is, it is a sense that every one of us experience. Um, it is one of those rare moments uh, when when our own self of identity is dissolved, simply put. It's one of those rare moments. It could, it could be when you're just taking a trek. Uh, you know, you're on a mountain, it could be anywhere. It could be a walk in the park. And just momentarily, somehow, you don't care a damn who you are. In fact, that's irrelevant because what you're experiencing is so magnificent and so overwhelming that it is kind of drenching you. And it's, um, mm. and, and emotionally, it's, uh, you know, it's just the experience that exists. It's an abstract way of putting it, but that's the only way to put it, that the emotion exists. And yeah. you're just, you're just breathing it and taking it in. And well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a kind of, that is bhakti. I mean, now whether you engineered it, in the sense engineered seems to be a technical term, but whether you, you participate in it's happening or not, the experience is real. Yeah. So if you think, because, and, and I think we all in life go through that. Now, this can happen when you stand in front of, the, in, in a sanctum sanctorum, in a temple, in a church, in a darkha, it can happen there too. Okay? No doubt about it. And I'm, I'm, this is not, and I'm, this got nothing to do with each one's personal belief system. Okay? That's their personal belief system, and I have no right to comment on it. But I'm saying that that experience can happen anywhere. Okay? Um, if you think of it like that, then I think it is actually not an accident. Mm. Um, I don't like, bhakti is not an accident, or you want to call it bhakti, it's not an accident, or the profoundity of the moment is not an accident. It what comes you from, call that experience? whatever you want to call it. I mean, you use any word you want. Uh, it happens because of a certain commitment and a certain intense 
involvement by the individual. Now, even when you were trekking, you allowed yourself to be engrossed and intensely involved for that moment in whatever was around you and within you, and that's when it clicked in. Just like that, when you sing Sa, Pa, or Sa, or you're tuning the four Tandisa to Tambura, if you let that sound and you're able to intensely give yourself. So it is actually a conscious action by the human being. And that's the magnificence of it. We, we kind of think that bhakti is not, is, not, is not a human endeavor. I'm, thinking it's, I'm telling you bhakti is a human endeavor. It's a human endeavor. And, but you know why we are scared of it is because that endeavor leads to you not having control over it. <laughs> you lose right? yourself. Yeah, yeah, but if I then attach it to certain baggages that I carry, I have control over it. <laughs> so if I say I attach it to my belief system, then I have a structure to hold on to say that association is what it is. Okay, and this is a temporal creation, right? This is an actual tactile temporal creation, whether it is your, uh, you know, your, your text or your, your song or your word or your idol. These are all temporal. Now, we need temporal things as a species to feel that we are in control. So you use this control system and you then actually suffocate bhakti within a control system. Because then you have control over bhakti. Then you can say this is bhakti and that is not bhakti. Mm. Or you can say that Mr. Krishna doesn't call it bhakti, but it's this bhakti. You could do that too. <laughs> right? Right? So, because as a species, we like to control. Come on. We love to control things. We love to be, love to know that we know, know where it's going. We know how I feel. We know I'm going to feel tomorrow. We don't want a state where we can't control. So, therefore, uh, this notion that bhakti has categories or bhakti comes from certain belief systems is our way of controlling the matter, controlling it. But if we say no, it's the possibility of you being intensely, incredibly involved conscious in something, it could be anything, then I think it becomes something even more magical. So, you know, where you, you I mean, I noted this down when you were speaking to Ritwik about uh, the emotions and the intensity when I sing. And I think this is the, this, this is the only thing I learned. And this happened because of the fact that I opened my mind and my being to several other experiences in life. I started reading. I read more. I started going back into history. I started involving myself in my own problematized existence as a person in a social structure. All this actually is the reason why I'm intense. Which is why I keep telling people, you can't separate my word and my music. You may not figure it, but you can't separate it. Because my intensity is because every time I see this beauty, I'm saying, why are we so ugly? Hmm. And every time you see yourself as ugly, you're saying, this is, a, this is where we should be going. It could be anything. It need not be only music. It could be anything in life. And therefore, the intensity comes only from that. Because I, I, I really feel that you need to allow that to consume you so that you are nothing. Mm. And then you realize what you're doing beyond the two hours that you sing or beyond the half an hour. You think you do everything to control yourself and control people. So uh, that's how I would answer a question in a long-winded way, way, as I always do. <laughs> that's the next thing. <laughs> so um, sort of moving uh, back to you, Ritvika, now. So what have, you've talked about your, you know, the dynamics and the relationship that you had with, uh, with, with Krishna. Um, uh, can you think, of, are there any particular moments or experience that you can think of over the last uh, 17 years worth that really stand out to you that, you know, that was, I wouldn't say turning points, I'm not going to dramatize it because it's, as Krishna and I said, it's a lot more complicated. But any moments that stand out to you and that have, you know, stay, stick in your memory as being really sort of pertinent moments for you? I can think of a few, but I can't say it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping probably those aside. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there are probably a couple, but... I mean, I mean, but it's extremely difficult to narrow down because there are so many things. Um, yeah. 
that are so memorable over the years. I would say probably <coughs> around 2007, I think, I think was the first time uh, that I probably sang along with him on stage. I think it was in Hyderabad, um, yeah. where just a, just a couple of days ago, he taught me the song in Mohanam, Narasimhagacha. And mm. uh, he began to sing and then just looked back and said, and nodded his head saying, sing. So I didn't really understand what he was saying then. But so, I mean, so I wasn't sure if he wanted more volume when I was playing the tambura. So I started playing that louder. And then, <laughs> and then he just looked back and said, pardon. And that was the first time I ever sang along with him. And then he probably didn't ask me to sing along for another year and a half. So I don't know what prompted it um, <laughs> that particular day. But uh, that was completely unexpected. And um, I remember that being extremely memorable. Um, so that was one of the times. But there are so many moments from our conversations when we travel. Um, traveling with him is great fun. It's in fact extremely difficult to keep up with him, not just while traveling, but just in anything that you know we kind of do together. So um, all of those things are always an experience. But uh, I'm more interested in hearing what he thinks probably comes to his mind when he has to probably pick one and maybe say uh, <laughs> sticks with him over the years. You don't want that in public. Don't even try me. You know, I don't care about private things coming public. I know you care. So watch it. <laughs> <laughs> we will edit that out. Don't worry. You can always edit this out. No, I'm <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So one of the things that he's probably recollected over a period of yeah. time across the years, many uh, in many different junctures, um, this I think is safe to be out in public. But he used to have one of these extremely complicated wooden curtain thingies in his house that that were so old that it was impossible to use the threads to actually pull them up. And I remember in one class where um, three, four of us were sitting and uh, he looked at me and said, can you pull the screens up? And I remember giving it a shot for a good minute, minute and a half and there was nothing happening and there's a recording of two minutes of him trying to instruct what I need to do and me completely messing that up. And uh, <laughs> he never lets me forget that. And I know that he's already also probably gotten a couple of students to keep that recording aside. No, so, we actually, actually our class recordings are super fun. I know some of them just listen to it and laugh because it also has my abuse, right? I'm cursing them and saying, why the hell can't you sing? I'm all re leaving all the beeps out, okay? The beeps are also there within it. And I'm uh, uh, <laughs> telling them all kinds of things and they have all their recordings and they're, some of them have threatened me that they will make it public at some point of time. <laughs> and that people the know really, really what happened in class. But uh, those recordings are funny. They're so funny now, you know, when we, you know, we're arguing and then these guys are doing stupid things and cursing them and somebody else is laughing. And actually one important thing I must tell you, you know, all these discussions that we have, uh, in class, in, at home. A very important person in the older discussion is a musician by name Sangeeta Shivakumar, who we can't forget in these discussions. Absolutely. So, um, yes. you know, though she will not be, I mean, um, she had her own work and her class and her kacheri is all happening. Whenever there was class, there's all the conversations can be heard everywhere. So whether it is a musical discussion or whether it is a social discussion, at some point she would come and argue and uh, usually will be to refute what I said in class uh, or to correct some Sangati that I taught them and said so, the, so she was as much part of the discussions in class or post class or the debates that have happened or the arguments that have happened. So very, very important participant in, um, so in many ways they have learned a lot from her Absolutely. Uh, as much as, they, as they've learned from me, though I'm their guru within quotes. <laughs> So, Professor, you, one thing you've uh, alluded to is obviously you had multiple students uh, learning and having group classes as well um, with students of similar abilities. Um, I, personally, obviously, having, having had individual classes and group classes as well, the dynamics in those that you have with your guru is very different. You have the interactions with your peers as well. Um, and not everyone <coughs> has the same talent ability and the same grasp as well, you know, even amongst the similar broad uh, level of, uh, of singing. So how do you deal with that as a teacher? How do you approach that having a, having a group of students um, which you teach at the same time and those com complex interactions that happen between students as well? See, I mean, uh, ideally you should have both. You could have opportunities yeah. for uh, individual class and group class. Yeah. But what has happened with me is because of time constraints and because of my other activities, uh, time for both has kind of diminished mm. quite some time. So a group is the only possibility for 
Um, and also, I think um, a lot of the students who come to me are now at a point where they can learn Kirtanams by themselves. I mean, I really, yeah. I mean, many times if you, I mean, they have archives of classes for the last, I don't know how many years they have. And they yeah. probably know more Kirtanams than I know. They can pick it up from anywhere. So, I mean, I don't think I'm really needed for that. So what I try and use class for is to do interesting things. Uh, just to try and push the pedal. Try and... Uh, uh, Try and think, make them think in a way that you would not think normally. Uh, that for me is fascinating. So, you know, if you think of, I mean, I always think that um, I use the word opportunity. I said, you missed an opportunity there. And they say, where? I said, okay, sing that phrase again. And I'll show you an opportunity there. So I think those are the things that I try to push. You know, a little, we play games in class. We kind of, the way we do things, we kind of play little things. So there, I think what happens is, uh, yeah, it's complicated because there are some students who may not be at the same level. At the same time, I, I can understand it. So I try and give them a little helping hand there. At the same time, it also makes them feel that, you know, they can push and they are singing along with the senior colleague. Yeah. So maybe there's also a possibility that, you know, that I can also move. So I think it works both ways. And I also, at least in our group, I think it's important that I try, it. I don't know if these guys do it, but I keep telling them, is for them to support the younger students in some fashion, yeah. especially when you have a guru like me who doesn't have the time now to do it. So in fact, yeah. I don't do this now because I really know I can't. I want to. I hope that this, I was hoping, by the way, that this year I'm going to change that. But thanks to Mr. COVID, uh, everything is kind of now, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. But the idea was to take a new set of students. I had this whole idea of taking a new set, completely new set, because I don't think these guys really need me. I mean, they need to come and see me. I mean, uh, yeah, I can give them, I, I can give them tools and ideas and say, you know, Think this way. Think, I, for me, the most interesting thing is can we change the way we perceive something? Could we just force swarms? But can we just change the way we are looking at it? You know, and hmm. then maybe then maybe you see something you never saw before. Uh, I think to a large extent we have not done that. You know, what we have done in music is permutations, combinations. You know, I, you know, hmm. I, I'm not one who is so enamored by uh, vocal ability or by um, by simple permutation cam combination and, a, and what happens a combination of vocal ability and being able to do incredible permutation combination is taken as intellectual music. That's lowest mm. common denominator for me. That's so unabstract. It may be attractive. You can love it. That's a different thing. I'm never going to comment on your choices. I am making an objective I, intellectual conversation, intellectual debate here, and I'm happy to debate this. So my, my, so I think I'm, I'm not personally enamored of it because I know what the tools are to get there. Okay. And to me, the tools are very linear and I'm, I think linear tools are generally some, as I would not where art exists. Art exists when it's non-linear and it is abstract. And I think for that, I'm talking about a slightly more complex way of looking at ideas. Okay, so if you look at terms of forms, I mean, instead of looking at terms of, look at, look at, look at them as forms, then, I mean, it's like looking at the globe from different angles. You can't look at the globe in a linear fashion, right? You have to look at the globe as a form. And then the form, and it rotates, and you move. Then it's a very abstract notion you start build, building of it. If you think of a phrase like that, or if you think of a raga like that, if you think of Carnatic music itself like that, then it's something, I think something else can click. Okay, something yeah. else can happen. And then the whole notion of intellectualism, which is not uh, uh, separated from being emotional, they, are, they, are, they live together, uh, then becomes something very deep. That's when the emotional the intellectual actually come together yeah. and hug. Yeah. Uh, and that, this is, is, um... that fascinates me. That fascinates me. That's what I push in class. That's all that, I push. Arrest that, their job. They can, they're, they're, I mean, they can handle it. You know. And that, that's, a, that's really um, a theme that we actually were keen to explore with both of you is, is this concept of uh, maturity as a musician um, in terms of your, your development stages. You know, often many of us will have gone through the stage where we want to, you know, calculate X number of corvées and kanaka and do all this and that and brigas and whatever. And then you eventually realize that you know, uh, you know, as if it's some kind of, I mean, I don't want to romanticize the journey either, but, you know, you perhaps come to a different um, uh, position on how you use these tools. 
and how you're using them as a vehicle for uh, um, conveying the underlying art. And, and you know, obviously, you know, you can hear in uh, both of your recordings going back, even Krishna, so your recordings as, uh, you know, mastery over all of these aspects, but obviously there's a, supreme, there's a sublimeness, you know, that we hear um, in some of the, for example, the first edition arts videos that come out uh, that show a very different part of that artistic journey. And also, uh, you know, Ritwig, from your perspective, how, how do you feel this journey of, you know, complexity and mathematics and all these kinds of things comes in in, in part of your musical journey and, and how does that mature? You go, he asked you, go. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I think as a student of music, we've had so many classes where we've just discussed and probably analyzed a couple of core ways for over a period of two, two and a half hours. It in fact happened just maybe even about three or four months ago where um, we fought. He was, yeah, where we had a, a huge fight about one of the core ways that was um, played in the recording of a song that he was listening to from many years ago. Um, from which he taught me that song. And uh, such conversations do happen. Uh, it's uh, a lack of that in the music today does not mean that a certain kind of a thought process or um, a certain kind of um, discussion about uh, subjects like say permutation, combination or mathematics does not does happen. happen. Um, I yeah. remember where he once asked me in class to sing only Kanak or only Purta. I remember mm -hmm. where um, he used to give me five or six different lines from the same comp from the same composition or um, five, six different lines from different compositions for the same talam and asked me to make core ways on the spot. So all of that is extremely important as part of the journey, whether, um, whether it is about learning to um, improve your mathematical skills when you're singing a Ragam Thanam Pallavi, when you're learning to do a Trikalam or when you're um, using the idea of math within a narrative, all of that is extremely mm -hmm. um, kind of part and parcel of the music. But do you then make it musical or do you kind of showcase the math more obviously is where I think a personal choice lies. And I think the moment the math is more obvious, um, it more often than not seems probably less musical to me personally. But if um, math is kind of imagined over a layer of music where music is given predominance or prominence, then the idea of music within that math also takes a different shape. So for me, mm. I think that's a very interesting journey and, I, <clears throat> and beyond the point, we all go through those phases of being crazy about doing Purutams or doing Kanaku or coming up with multiple different core ways or coming up with core ways that have a Purutam in the end that create this lovely effect at the end of a large swaram mm. that kind of makes or breaks your concert. So all of this is definitely part of the process. But I think beyond a point when you talk about maturity, which is what you start uh, kind of started your question with, um, it becomes a matter of personal choice. And as you mature as an artist, you make certain choices based on what you truly believe in and what um, you believe your art should be. And once those choices are made, that doesn't mean that the ones that you keep aside or do not engage with as regularly as you did before are um, necessarily lesser. It's, yeah, yeah, it's just a different journey that um, where I see more life or I see more um, opportunity and that I wish to explore. Mm. They all informed your journey to get to where you are. Absolutely. Interesting. Uh, sort of go going on well, sort of it's common folklore, or I don't know, I heard it quite a few times, uh, at least um, when I was growing up. So uh, teach, teachers would uh, reluctantly say, okay, you know, this students or students' families approached me to take them on. And it's common folklore that, you know, if a student approaches you, no matter good or bad, whatever, you, you try and take them on if you have the time available to do it. And I've spoken to a lot of people who've said they only take on students past a certain level or they, you know, they take on beginner students as well. And, you know, what a... <laughs> What is your view on that, Krishna, sir, in terms of taking students on at different levels? Um, and, and in terms of once you've reached a certain point with a certain teacher, because the relationship between a student and teacher is nuanced, <clears throat> and are, you know, presumably people have certain skill set to pull people up to a certain stage. At, one, at what point does uh, 
a teacher student recognizes, okay, the journey sort of come to, to an end between in terms of our teaching relationship here, and I'm going to pass you on to someone else. To, you know, at what stage could that happen, theoretically? I, it's a very tough one, right? It's a very difficult one, and I, I, I you know, it's very difficult for a teacher um, to actually do that. I mean, I think yeah. many of the teachers who have done that and who have sent their students to me are extremely gracious human beings, uh, because um, it is. Uh, I mean, to believe that your student has something to learn from somebody else uh, requires a great level of maturity from the teacher's uh, for, you know, position. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a tough one. I think it's a tough one. Um, I, mean, I mean, look, if you are a teacher by profession, I mean, if that's what you're doing, then you naturally take people from different levels and you have time and you're doing that. And I think then that's a different way Then teaching becomes your life. If you are a performing musician who's on stage, uh, and then I also teaching. I mean, not that teaching becomes lesser, but time then becomes a definitely a problem. Then you can't take people at different stages because the person who's just starting off needs far more of your time to do rote, simple mm. rote stuff, right? And you don't have the bandwidth. And honestly, I don't even have the mental patience. I don't have the patience. <laughs> I don't have the patience today to tell somebody to say, re, re, re. I mean, I would have done it 20 years ago. I can't do it now. Um, and um, that's true. So um, you, I think it's in uh, those people who actually do that are incredible people because they are the ones who actually gift. You know, I mean, unfortunate thing about um, uh, popularity or names being known is ultimately only that name gets known even as the teacher, right? Yeah. And that yeah. that's the tra that's, that's that's so wrong and it's a tragedy. So many times what happens is the person who actually did the road stuff, who made sure that you got a student who was at a level who could understand what you're trying to say. You know, I didn't do anything for that person to understand what I did. The person was already equipped with, with all the tools to understand and grasp. That person is forgotten. So uh, when we always speak about Carnatic music, we forget the uh, ecosystem, the most important part of the ecosystem being the people who teach and especially those who teach the beginning stages of the art form. We, uh, we only think of the ones who do the glamorous teaching or the glamorous performing. And I think that, I think, I think, I think we are, I mean, I would take responsibility as one of those people whose face is plastered everywhere as people who don't uh, say enough and do enough uh, to make sure that these names are known uh, much more. I think uh, we are responsible for it. Yeah, and it, it, interesting about uh, a related point about the discipline um, involved at, you know, of getting those early stages in. Uh, you know, a lot of our early exercises, um, you know, whatever, whether Saturday Wadda says and all this, <clears> are things that professional musicians still rely on for keeping their agility of their instrument or voice uh, at all stages of their career, right? And so a question I had for both of you as busy people, you know, who are not solely focused on just the one thing that you do, um, you know, obviously, Krishna, so you're involved in so many different things. Uh, um, and uh, uh, Ritwik, your, your wife is a busy Bharatanatyam um, dancer herself in her, own, in, in her own right. How do you find time in the day for the discipline of the basic stuff um, with everything going around you? And another thing I know that, uh, you know, uh, Krishna, so when you, when you were in your ascendancy, you had young kids as well. I have a four year old, you know, so this is a very useful piece of advice for me personally. And I'm sure lots of people watching this. <laughs> You're podcast. asking the wrong person this question. <laughs> Absolutely the wrong person. I'm a very lazy guy. Uh, I've, uh, well, have I physically practiced hard? Yes. I think in my formative days, I've done crazy practice. But beyond that, I'm a very lazy guy. You know, I am not one who's going to be sitting and singing for six hours. Let me be very clear. I'm not. Um, I've, I've, I've worked more here. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, that's how I work. I mean, I don't physically work as much. I mean, it's, it's, it's always there running and working, whether it's a new composition I'm setting or whatever, you know, just singing to more part of the Buddha. I mean, so I am actually the wrong person who should ask this question in terms of discipline. I have none of it. <laughs> I'm very ill-disciplined man. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that rigor. There was a time when that rigor was, was completely there. It was very important. You know, when I was in school and college, I mean, I practiced 11 hours a day. Actually, 11 hours. I've sung through the night. I practiced with a friend from 9 p.m. to 4, 4 a.m. So, yeah, I mean, we've done that. But I, by, by, by nature, I'm not one who's going to get up every day and say, I have to sing one hour today and make sure. No, I'm not going to do it. 
I'm not made that way. Now, is that good or bad? I don't know. I've managed somehow and I've, I've, I've so far. Maybe it's bad and I shouldn't be this way and you, I will realize it when I turn 60. Possible. And it's too, too late to regret. But this is, this is how I am. I mean, this is how I am. I do work hard. I do work hard, but I work in a very, very weird way. You know, Ritwik knows how, how, how it is. And that's just uh, my nature. So I think that as far as practicing is concerned, you know, it doesn't matter when you practice. It doesn't matter how long you practice. It matters how you practice. That's all I will say. If you, I mean, sometimes 10 minutes of practice maybe may give you much more than three hours of just nonsense that you will be giving because you're not in it. So there are two things to practice, right? There's practice to keep your abilities in place. If it's a voice or an instrument, then you're just, it, it, that's a mechanical need. Mm. Okay. And then there's practice, which is beyond that. I think one, you have to separate the two. Okay. Don't confuse the two. The former needs physical sitting. You have no choice. The latter need, doesn't really need physical sitting, but needs actual Im uh, immersion. Absolutely. So you figure out how you, will Im how you can immerse yourself. Okay? As long as you know this and you figure a way, you're fine. I'm not going to tell you you have to get up in my morning at 4 o'clock. All my practice was at, at night. <laughs> well, after 10 p.m., after 11 p.m. I never woke up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning and did Akara Samika. I did not do it. Okay. So I... What's your I, perspective on this? What? <laughs> Four o'clock? I was asking whether Ritwik's... Uh, what, how is his experiences were different to yours? I don't know. In the discipline issue. Uh, it's interesting that he says that because he expected utmost discipline from all of us, especially in the formative years in terms of making sure we did all of these exercises. You know what? One second, one second. Remember I told you I never asked them to do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but you asked them to do what you didn't now, do. Now we, now we know why. <laughs> right. Um, but for me, actually, I've just turned 30. So I kind of realize now um, certain things about my voice, about my body, and things that are unique to me. And um, it's extremely important to realize that every voice and every body is different, and you need to um, uh, treat it with respect for it to be at the top of its game and listen to whatever it is that you wanted to do. So um, for me, it's kind of been the same thing. I, I think when I was much younger, much like he said, we, a bunch of us used to get together and practice. Um, some of us as students would get together and practice. Some of my other musician friends, we all would get together and practice and it would go on for hours together. But in terms of actually waking up and doing the morning practices and all of that was limited to my much earlier learning um, during my formative years. But Actually, over the last year, year and a half, I've gotten back to doing that because I recognize that my voice needs me to spend that 15, 20 minutes in the morning the moment I wake up. Right. And that is something that I've realized now, um, which maybe if I had started doing five years ago, um, my voice or my body might be reacting a different way now, but it is part of the process. But I think what is extremely important is to make sure that you don't allow your physical ability to define your art. Mm. What is important is that yeah. your art is driven by its aesthetic and not by the other limitations, which is a huge challenge that I'm sure every artist, including me, is constantly dealing with and finding ways to grapple with. But in terms of practice, when you sit down to achieve a certain goal, let's say I want to sing 100 one hour swarams for some kirtana. So if that is my goal then, then that is a very different way of looking at sitting down and practice at this stage in uh, my journey as a musician as opposed, as opposed to approaching it from the angle of trying to explore certain facets of a raga or even exploring a raga that I haven't explored before. Um, so that is the kind of practice that interests me now. But right. I've never been a kind of person to again like Anna said, practice for that many hours together a day, but I've always been the kind of person to listen to at least three, four hours of solid music every day that I continue to do even today. And for me, that really keeps me going and that keeps my mind fresh and keeps giving me fresh ideas. And um, for me, I believe that my music is today what it is because of the amount that I've listened to 
as opposed mm -hmm. to the amount that I've actually sit down and practiced. So maybe, maybe kind of in a way, what he, I mean, like what he said, maybe the work happens here more as opposed right. to um, sitting down and singing at this stage as opposed to just requiring to do the bare minimum, I guess. And that's a, that's a really fascinating insight for our viewers. Uh, of, you know, it's not only the qu quantity, but it's the quality of the practice, basically, that, uh, yeah, uh, or mean, whatever's going on in there that, that matters. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, many times these guys have asked me, you know, how do I get through day? I, you know, it, that's one thing I can do, uh, is the moment I'm studying Tambura, I'm in it. That's it. So, it's a, that's, it's a conscious way of just getting into it. I think once that can happen, it doesn't matter. Everything else becomes immaterial. So if can you I practice... You a, sorry, can I ask you a asking question? Me? Here? Me? Yeah, asking me? Uh. Asking you a question here. So just like what you said, the moment you begin to tune the tambura, you're into it. But I've often found that the moment the concert is over, you often find it difficult to get out of it. So yeah. why oh. is it that this is easy, but that probably is not as easy? Yeah, that's because uh, what you're, you're, what you're um, of offering yourself when you tune in is that intensity, right? You're not in it, right? you're offering yourself that intensity. And uh, then uh, you are allowing yourself to be in it. And if, you're, uh, if your commitment that day is that, that, that powerful, then it becomes a very intense happening. I, I, whether it's intense for the audience or not is irrelevant to what I'm saying. Okay? Now, and then, so therefore, after which getting out of it becomes, is definitely much harder. It is much harder to, to tune out. Okay. For us, but I think also to be able to tune in is not magic. That's what I go back to. It's not magic. You know, it's not some, some ability that I have or something. No, it's not magic. It's just, just what I spoke about before. So your practice should also have, that is my point. Hmm. Mm. And that's what, I mean, uh, that's what, that's what uh, practice should be. Yeah. And, uh, and Ritvik, you also mentioned that, you know, you try and even up till now, listen to at least three or four hours of, of, of music a day. Um, what's the method and how, how you listen? Because I guess there are various ways to listen to, to something or a concert that you're hearing. There's active listening, passive listening. You know, what, what, what do you, does it vary in terms of day to day in terms of what you're looking at in a, in a concert or, or recordings when you're going through them? How, how, what's the process for you? Right. When you talk about active and passive listening, there is, there are a bunch of recordings that I passively listen to that I've listened to from when I was extremely yeah. young. Um, those are probably the recordings that I received as CDs when I joined him because I remember around 2004, he had a bunch of CDs with mm. alphabets written on them. M-V-I-R-K and I had no idea what any of these alphabets meant and uh, he said just listen to all of this and gave me a bundle of CDs and uh, mm. I copied all of them and brought back and brought them back to class and asked him what each of them meant. M-V-I was Maharaj Paramishwanatha, R-K was Ramnath Krishnan. So for me all of these were just names but discovering their music through those mm. um, recordings and creating a relationship with their music, with their voice. Um, there is a sort of image that runs through your head that plays a strong role in those formative years. So there are some of those recordings that I keep going back to, that I passively listen to, that I have a sort of an emotional um, connection with. Um, but the other recordings or the newer music or the other genres of music that I listen to now is not passive listening. Uh, because I because am not somebody who can um, listen to something new passively where my mind doesn't automatically go to it. In fact, there have been so many times mm -hmm. when I'm driving or at home where I'm listening to a new piece of music and uh, um, Shweta is probably asking something and I'm not even reacting because my mind is completely tuned into that. So I think um, listening to three, four hours of music a day isn't as big a deal as opposed to listening to even just one hour of music, but where that one hour is focused and your complete attention is with every nuance of what you're picking up. And I guess the more you listen, the more you begin to pick up and the more you process, um, your mind automatically then, I guess, begins reacting to music very differently and um, gives you way more possibilities the next time you sit down to sing. So for me, that is why I say that listening is as important a process for me as mm. much as sitting down and actually physically singing. Mm. 
yeah. and that that uh, exploration delving into things and exploring the possibilities and is, is a fascinating uh, 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 topic that you've opened up there. One thing that uh, is, we're very familiar with um, from Krishnan's uh, recordings is exploring possibilities for manodharma in places that we haven't touched before, right? Or maybe have been forgot about. So, uh, for example, I heard a beautiful recording of Bharo Krishnaya where you sing Swaram's uh, uh, in, in there and, uh, you know, the Ragam, Tanam, Varnam, all these kinds of uh, things that we haven't touched for some time. Uh, and also, Ritvik, to you, equally, the question is how, what's the way that we can open our sensibilities to Manodharma in its broadest sense of the term to actually allow for these possibilities? And how can we, you know, uncover this beauty in places that we haven't looked before? Right. Um, Anna, I'll let you go. No, you go, you go, you go. Okay. So, um, so I guess if you're looking to sing Nerval for a Kriti like Sri Subramanya Namaste, then Vasavadi Sakaladeva is probably the most obvious choice. And as a student of music, you need to do that hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. For all of the songs, for all of the so-called time-tested lines that are normally picked up for Nerval by millions of artists where you keep listening to various different interpretations of them and then you have your own interpretation also in your mind. But what that kind of does is it gives you a lovely framework um, with respect to multiple talams or um, different spacing of lyrics um, or <clears throat> finding ways by which you can explore the raga within that particular line. And beyond a point, you begin to see those opportunities in different lines. And mm -hmm. uh, I, in fact, remember so many times when Anna would do something new on stage, um, like singing Swaram first. I think, I think the earliest memory I have of him doing something like that was for um, a song... Uh, Raju Vedale in Todi, where he sang Swaram, Kirkala Swaram for the Charanam line first and then moved on and then sang Neraval for the third line of the Charanam later. So, hmm. until then, I had never listened to somebody sing the Swaram first and then the Neraval because the common way of listening to that is always listening to the Neraval first and then the Swaram or just the Swaram or just the Neraval. So, I remember asking him after that concert what prompted that. For which his answer was very simple saying, when I sang the first line of the Charanam, it automatically felt like I had to sing a few Swaras. And the Swaras were only in Kirkalam. And then when he moved on to the third line, where um, you still hear many musicians sing Nerval too, he still sang Nerval in that line. So I think it's important to not have prefixed ideas, but to kind of go with the flow. And I think the moment you're secure enough about your music to take those chances and let yourself go with the flow, then there are all these possibilities that have always existed, but you probably kind of open up your mind to be able to also acknowledge them. And uh, I think that's been a great process and he makes all of, and he makes all of us do that in class. Um, mm -hmm. I remember once when he picked a line in an Atatala Varnam in Canada and made me sing Nerval in that and with a Tana Varnam, the words are so spaced out that I remember struggling so badly. But those are the kind of challenges that then make you go back home and sit and practice and then to maybe kind of try and figure that out, you pick a ragam that you're probably more comfortable with like Kamboji or Bhairavi and then practice um, a Nerval for one of those lines and one of those varnams and then you get back to this. So all of that is a process and he's somebody who's always open to ideas wherever it exists, irrespective of where it comes from. I remember a discussion on one of the things that he'd done in a concert where just to play devil's advocate, I um, then just made a mention to him saying, you know, if this is the logic that you're using for singing Nerval for that line, then technically you should not be singing Melkala Swaram for a Kirkalam line. And at that point, he said something to me and I don't remember exactly what, but I remember that from the next concert, I did not find him singing male Kalam Swarams for the Kirkalam line. It wasn't because only I said it, because I know the intention of why I said it. It was more as an argument as opposed to it actually being from a place of intellectual thought. But that really told me that irrespective of where he gets an idea from, unless he thinks about it and he sees the pros and cons of it and he knows what it can do for his own art and for his own music, he doesn't actually 
implement something into his music just for the sake of doing something different and when you speak to him about it when you have a conversation when you actually listen to him sing that is abundantly clear and i think that's given a lot of um, confidence and faith for younger musicians like myself to be um, convinced about what we are doing and to have complete conviction in every decision that we make artistically mm. so that's a huge gift um, i guess from learning from somebody like him krishna now what's your perspective on that well i i, I only think the carnatic music has three elements everything else is just uh, top layer uh, icing on the cake the three elements are simple they are raga they are tala slash laya and there is text now everything that you sing is an interaction of these three elements everything uh, your alapana has text because tadari is a text and for an instrumentalist every every position that you hit or every bow that you do is a text okay mm-hmm. You can call it tatakaram. You can call it what you want. It is a text. So that's what. That's why I use the broader word text. Uh, yeah. So ultimately, Carnatic music is interaction of these three elements. Okay. If you if you bring it down to that, so I say a, a kirtanam is an interaction of these three elements. It's question of how these three elements relate with each other. Uh, Naraval is an interaction. Swaram is an interaction. Everything is. Then mm. the possibilities that appear in front of your eye. are unbelievable uh if you think of everything else as being on, only per- perceivable things which you, you can move away and music will still exist then nothing stops you nothing there is nothing to stop you nothing to say you should not sing this you should not stand here you should not do this as long as these three elements in play and there is honesty towards these three elements in play then then what the whole world is in front of you you give me any kirtan yeah. now i will show you the world in front of you that yeah. actually it's not it's not so complicated it's it's actually be- i mean i i don't think it's it's rocket science it's very simple yeah. uh i mean you give me any kirtan and i will show you what has been missed in it and it's been missed because of every other scaffolding we have built on around it right and those scaffoldings depending on you know your school depending on so many things that uh, you know the rights and wrongs my question is is it doing injustice to any of these three parts and i'm using again the word text and not lyrics because they have very different meanings by text do you mean the use of a syllable anything text is anything it can be a syllable it can be a combination of syllables that may be a word it can be a combination of syllables that's a sonic communication now uh, tam 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 is a combination of three syllables which has no semantic ne- semantic uh, meaning but it has meaning musically it's not it's not nonsensical you didn't you didn't say clap blue too you said tam 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 because when you say tam 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 there is an emotional resonance in it through the structure of the form of the form therefore as long as you think about carnatic music as this then well seriously the world is a stage i mean any kirtan or any composition there is nothing that is trivial there is nothing that is uh, you know at the end of it uh, even an akaram in a kirtan then becomes a possibility to do something so it becomes i think it's kind of for me liberating entirely liberating. Mm. no for yeah, me yeah fascinating just, to help us yeah i mean no i here for me i think i just want to add that um when we spoke about having classes and learning uh as opposed to kind of listening to all of this in as many words when you're sitting on stage with him there is something like this that pops up in so many moments in every single concert that is new new in terms of form new in terms of structure and many of the times i'm sure it's something that hit him right there at that moment and not something that is preplanned and the spontaneity of that is magical so the more you're exposed to the music of a person who is in the moment somebody like him the more that it rubs off on you and the more that you think about it even if you don't necessarily have the capabilities to be able to recreate that it at least leaves an impact on your mind that then allows you to explore it in a certain way so i think that so i think listening to every single one of his concerts is as much a learning experience as sitting in an, on one class i guess wonderful yeah no that's really lovely reflect so one thing we want to ask both of you really is that you know we're moving to a more digital age um and the way music is presented in general i mean the possibilities are growing in terms of outside your set concert format 
um, that that you know we ran with for so many decades. Um, uh, Ritvik, I know you, you've had a lot of your videos and you've been uploading content up um, on digital platforms and Krishna sir as well has done various initiatives um, you know, in, in, uh, on digital platforms as well. Um, how, how does this allow scope for the art to grow itself? Um, how, how do you see Carnatic music going forward with, with the use of digital platforms? I mean, I think we are, we are still, uh, it's a very nascent stage of understanding. Uh, as far, I mean, this, I'm answering this question purely regarding Carnatic music and not the larger world of art. Uh, I think it's still very nascent in terms of uh, how this is going to go forward. There's no doubt that this is going to become an important platform. I think there yeah. is an important point that I want to make here is, you know, um, and something that the internet world needs to think about. Because um, the whole basis of the internet environment is everybody has access and it's free, right? But one thing that it always ignored was the right of the artist. Uh, it completely ignored it. And I remember in the initial days I had started um, asking questions, then I just left it because I realized technology has taken over. I mean, you could just use a phone and record anything and put anything. Um, the whole question of, of the artist deciding what content needs to be, for example, online. Yeah. That is today almost not existent. Right? Yeah, you can you can say you you, you know write an email to Amazon.com and Amazon, I mean not Amazon, YouTube, and then YouTube takes up. I mean, come on, we all know how painful this, you know, if I just go Google, go on YouTube now and look at the number of videos there are, uh, many videos, I don't even know how these people got it. I mean, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. But I'm just saying that this we, we have to recognize, and I don't know the answer to this, that the entire audio industry has collapsed globally. Okay? Because of the idea that music needs, or performing arts, everybody has a right to it, needs to be free. Now, it, it's all fine if you're a billion dollar industry. Okay? And if you're this superstar who's going to be making money out of uh, these huge concerts. What happens when the, the whole economy of an art form is very, very small in which only the top five or six are anyway making bulk of the money and the rest of the people are pretty much in the margins. Where is their inflow? There is no sense of royalty. There is no royalty mm -hmm. flowing in from anything. So, you know, in this situation of COVID, I want to really, really flag that because so many people do have nothing today. They don't have savings. They talk about Carnatic music industry. I mean, if you mm. take six, five, six names like us off, and if you take from the, from the upcoming starts, Lirithwick and the other people off who were able to manage to some extent, the rest, the Ganjira artist, I mean, where do they go? Or, and even worse in the world of Nadaswaram and Tamil, where? So, you know, I think there needs to be a rethinking of this. And I, I'm, you know, with, I know it's complicated, but I think we, we made a, it's, a, it's a big problem today. It's a big problem because there's no source of income. So will the internet replace or, or be a parallel system? It needs to be. I don't think there's an option. There. I think uh, monetization through, the, through concerts online is possible. I actually did it in 2011. I don't know, many people don't know. In 2011, I streamed three concerts of mine and I monetized it. And all of us made it more money. My colleagues on stage and me. In 2011, we did a we did kind of a package and you know season concerts, I remember, right? Season uh, December, December, yeah, yeah. So and right now when we start when the whole um, Corona issue happened, I did this online concert 29th March, yeah. and we raised a considerable amount of money just by the online concert. So it is possible to monetize. Uh, the difficult questions is who has the access to monetize? Now the problem yeah. starts there. Again, it's only people like me who can actually make money enough money from the monetization. So then you will have to again go back to the sponsorship model. So mm -hmm. there needs to be a sponsorship model and there needs to be a revenue model. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a quasi uh, undergraduate economic student, I can say, I can use all these jargons. So, uh, so basically that economically it's the same model. It doesn't change. It's a platform that's changing, but that's still the model for any art form. You need state support or corporate support and you yeah. need revenue support unless you're again, mass following, right? I think it's the same economic structure that needs to be brought on online. Uh, what will it do the Sabahs? We don't know. 
I crack a joke here. A friend of mine said this to me a few days ago. Uh, you know, Munadi La, they used to say, Oh, sir, you know what crowds in this concert? House full, jam packed. Apparently, in that, another two months, when they, if they have concert, you say, Sir, sir, nobody came. Don't worry. Only 10 people came. They all sat apart. <laughs> so, we live in odd times. Yeah? So. And, <laughs> and pres presumably, having the better funding support and financial model will incentivize. Uh, more people from those, you know, those Nada Swaram and Tavil backgrounds, etc., to, to yeah, come in definitely. and be viable yeah, and not just it's viable yeah, to take need, up. Exactly. We need to, we need to, because that's, that's something that we need to think about. How are we going to provide access to this technology? Uh, you know, people may say, oh, everybody has a phone, they can record. No, it's a huge difference just taking a recording and putting it on FB. That everybody can do. This is a, this, to, to make people feel it's valuable. And they will actually dish out 10 bucks or 20 bucks on it. It requires a huge jump in terms mm -hmm. of the person putting up. So we don't have a system in place. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, I think we have no choice. We have to, at least till the point when we get back to stages, uh, you know, actually, at least in Carnatic music, you're lucky that you have a market that's across the globe that can watch online. Imagine art forms that are localized, where live performances is the only way. You know, geographically localized, politically localized, and it's live performances through three months of the year where everything happens. They can't be replaced with phones and digital. There, there's no option. So, I mean, I mean, it's going to require very creative thinking and very new thinking. Uh, let's see. Very interesting. And, Richard, and, and Richard, sure. sorry. Sure. Um, so, I do put out my videos on YouTube from time to time, but. I have over the past, I think, three or four years made a conscious effort to think about what content of my art form is out there on the internet. Because I do try and limit the amount of recordings that are happening um, of my concerts or even if I do find a one-off video from some concert, if I feel that the quality of the recording is just not up to it, then I don't think that that's a fair representation of my art form. So I try to see how I can maybe um, have that taken down. But the more important thing in a situation like this, I think, um, is to acknowledge is um, given that the ecosystem is so limited in terms of number and um, financially, the models are way more tighter. Uh, I guess one of the major reasons for, I think, why we are here today um, within at least the Karnataka <coughs> ecosystem is purely because mm. of um, having gotten into the habit of giving away everything for free. Uh, I guess all through the year in Chennai, if there are say 5,000 concerts, 4,500 of those concerts are free. And even the other 500 concerts which are ticketed are ticketed only during the month of December. So does that mean that none of the people who want to receive Carnatic music through the remaining 11 months actually want to pay for an art form that they actually derive something out of? This is an ecosystem at the end of the day. So I believe that that attitude needs shifting. I, in fact, yeah. um, was talking to a friend a couple of days ago, and I feel that going forward, once maybe whenever it is that the concerts resume, even if it's twenty rupees, even if it's even if it's fifty yeah. rupees, the tickets, the the concerts have to be ticketed so that people get into the mindset of having to open up their wallet and pay something, even if it's twenty mm. rupees to come there, sit there, and listen to the music. Mm. Weirdly, in, I mean, in a very weird way, that also places a certain amount of responsibility on the artist that probably the artist feels that is not necessarily there if he's singing a concert for free. So I believe that that attitude shift needs to happen. And I think artists need to be firm about the fact that they can get people to pay money for them and come listen to them. Mm. And that needs mm. to be normalized. That can't be a one-off thing during the season. Because if I'm singing 11 uh, months of free concerts, and if I'm suddenly singing um, concerts during the December that are all ticketed, what would prompt these people to listen to me during that one month that they don't get in the remaining 11 months? And what is their contribution to an ecosystem? I think mm. that idea can really be tapped into. So then we wouldn't be probably in a place where we don't have people paying for stuff online. We may be able to monetize more of it. We may be right. having more people who think it's normal to pay to buy an album of Carnatic music as opposed to thinking that it's, um, it's their right to have to listen to it for free on YouTube or some other online media. So I think artists also need to be 
creative about it and believe in themselves that their art is something that will sell that they can monetize mm -hmm. from which i think is also difficult in an environment like this when everybody is putting out things for free so if you feel you do not put things out for free and if you probably have to charge for them then you probably aren't going to reach the same number of people so i think it's a fine balancing act and yeah. um, it kind of needs a lot of revisiting and creative thinking i want to add one thing we have to throw into the dustbin this idea that commercialism is wrong there's nothing wrong in being commercial commercial is a transaction of commerce without which nothing can exist and there is no great pleasure in being poor okay and artists need not be poor to be great or need not to or need not to be need be need to be people who don't have wants and needs and cravings and aspirations which are all very material okay there is this absolute absolutely wrong nonsensical idea within the carnatic world that art somehow is this thing that is beyond all reality therefore artists uh, who demand artists who make money automatically become lower artists so artists have to somehow exist uh, at i you know always exist at a level where they are slightly lower than the commercial levels of the people who are coming into the hall slightly okay Uh, this 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 nonsense has to be thrown there is uh, please let's not let's not ever think that way okay we need artists to be healthy we need artists to have enough money and we need artists to also have the pleasures of life the worst thing is half the bozos who say this are those who are working in it companies and who are mbas across the globe Okay, I'm sorry. I'm saying it bluntly because it's absolutely irritating when this is said. Because they have no clue of the reality of the poverty that artists have. They have no clue, and it doesn't make you any better just because you wrote out a check during COVID. No, it doesn't. You didn't do a charity. You did something right for the first time in your life. So uh, I have to say this out here because this I am I'm, I'm tired of people constantly saying about you know how we didn't have any wishes. Somebody kept singing. There's nothing great about it. I have wishes and I still sing. Doesn't make me lower. Doesn't make my music lesser. Okay, you're there to listen to the music. Listen to the music. Make sure that I'm also healthy. And when I say I, I don't mean me, but I mean the world of arts. Um, I think it's been a a very in-depth and interesting discussion today. Um, and uh, from from my side i think we've explored a, a lot of the things that ranjan and i wanted to explore today in terms of the the way me, way teaching is conducted and your general attitudes uh, and outlook you no know, for me first i have to talk about this conversation because i think this is the first time he's done something like this and for me to be part of a online digital conversation like this with him is extremely different and i'm thankful for you guys for um giving me the space to be able to do this with anna and uh, i guess given the times that we live in um with respect to the uncertainty going ahead and uh, not knowing what the future is kind of going to hold especially being an artist and being part of a uh, ecosystem that is not entirely organized or systematic um there are a lot of questions in a, in the minds of a lot of artists but at least for artists like me who who have the necessary capability to be able to put out my work online or um who's privileged i feel that a conversation like this seems inconsequential when you kind of see so many other people going through difficulties and hardships and uh, i honestly believe that the community needs to come together at a time like this and everybody needs to do their bit in whatever way possible and in kind of whichever sphere whichever sphere they feel is important for them but it is important that we all kind of get together not just now but also for the future to figure out how we and how we effectively handle a situation like this if it presents itself again why is it that we lack the certain infrastructure right now because of which we are suffering and how do we correct these issues and build a firm um infrastructure going ahead so that we are equipped to handle something like this in the future so i think that is something that i've really been thinking about and anna has been doing of course phenomenal work in reaching out to so many people and um 
ideas from people like him are going to be even more precious at a time like this to kind of reinvent and figure out how it is that we go forward and what it is that we need to do to make sure that we are never put in a vulnerable position like this again for something as simple as a meal a day. So I mm. hope all of you do your um, part as part of this. I know Anna is never going to say it, but uh, Sumanasa Foundation is doing great work and uh, you guys can go online to their website and um, find details of all of uh, the activities that they're doing, the amount of people they're supporting from different spheres across art and migrant workers. And we all need to do our bit and I hope um, if you're seeing this that you contribute uh, to Sumanasa Foundation or to anybody else who's doing phenomenal work right now because everybody needs your help. Uh, I have no, I just want to tell, uh... I have no really profound messages for, you, for anybody. I just would like to say that uh, we are going through uh, very difficult and very unusual times for everyone in their own way, in their own uh, worlds. It, it, is, it is hard. Um, it is economically, physically, uh, emotionally, and psychologically uh, quite, quite unexplainable at some level, right? It's kind of almost bizarre. Uh, so all I can tell you is, of course, remain safe and uh, remain healthy. But it's also important, I think, for every one of us to use this time to uh, contribute in some little way that we can um, to all that we are seeing around us. And uh, in some way, uh, do what is right. Very simply put, do what is right. And make sure that those who have not, don't have now, get what is rightfully theirs. So all that we are, are, are just catalysts. So just in fact, agencies who are just passing on. So if you can find ways, please do it. Uh, please, uh, please try and, because this is a collective happening. And I think we should collectively find ways in which we can share, we can support, and uh, we can move forward. So that's all I will say. Um, stay safe.